Hello, I'm Dr. Tara Palmatier of shrinkformen.com. If you have a question or would like to schedule a session with me, you can reach me at shrinkformen at gmail.com. The subject of this video is female stalkers part one. What is stalking? And what's the difference between female and male offenders? This is from an article series that I published back in early 2011. Okay, here we go. Do you know what stalking is? Would it surprise you to know that many of your girlfriends, wives, or exes nuisance? Ah, dogs that many of your girlfriends, wives, or exes nuisance, clingy, possessive, angry, threatening, internet searching, social media, text, telephone, email, and other destructive behaviors technically qualify as stalking and harassment? Has your ex ever used family court, CPS, law enforcement, civil court, and criminal court to stalk and harass you? Are you aware that stalking and harassment are forms of abuse? Do you know that stalking and harassment, including using social media, are crimes? For many people, the word stalker conjures up the image of an obsessed delusional man lurking in the shadows and peeking through some poor woman's windows. But this is only half the story. Women stalk and harass their male partners and former partners too. If you've been involved with a high conflict and or abusive personality disordered woman, it's highly likely that you've been the target of stalking and harassment. Most male victims don't refer to female stalking behavior as stalking. They use words like crazy, obsessed, psycho ex, delusional, bitter ex-wife, vengeful ex-girlfriend, can't let go, can't move on, and a number of other equally appropriate descriptors. Nevertheless, these men are being stalked and harassed. So who engages in stalking behaviors more, men or women? Research shows female offenders engage in stalking and harassment behaviors with as much frequency as male offenders do. Why don't we hear about it? Because most domestic violence groups who serve women and media outlets at best grudgingly acknowledge male victims of female perpetrated abuse. Even worse, female perpetrated abuse and stalking behaviors are often portrayed as funny, retaliatory, righteous self-defense, or not as seriously in film and TV shows, talk shows, etc. For example, there are several blogs, uh, one of them is titled Confessions of a Facebook Stalker, um, where a woman proudly talks about how she stalks her ex on Facebook. You can also find countless memes shared on social media around this topic as well, making light of women who stalk and harass. Recent studies find that men and women seem to engage in stalking behaviors equally. Older studies show that women comprise the majority of victims. However, these figures are believed to be due to the way the questionnaires and surveys were worded in the older studies. It's also attributed to the fact that men are less likely to report a crime when a woman is the perpetrator because they're afraid of being ridiculed, not believed, and or because they don't believe they're in physical danger. Mullen et al. 2001 find, and I quote, men who find themselves the victim of a female stalker often confront indifference and skepticism from law enforcement and other helping agencies. Not infrequently, male victims allege that their complaints have been trivialized or dismissed. Some victims being told that they should be flattered 
by all the attention. Victimization studies indicate that women are seldom prosecuted for stalking offenses with criminal justice intervention, most likely to proceed in those cases involving a male suspect accused of stalking a woman. The available evidence suggests that stalking by women has yet to be afforded the same degree of seriousness attached to harassment perpetrated by men. This is despite any empirical evidence that women are any less intrusive or persistent in their stalking or pose any less of a threat, physical or otherwise, to their victims." End of quote. Langrickson, Rawling et al. used the Unwanted Pursuit Behaviors Inventory, or the UPBI, to determine the prevalence of former, excuse me, former intimate stalking type behaviors in an undergraduate population. <clears throat> this study finds no sex differences in overall UPBI scores of individuals who are the dumpies. Females and males indicate that they engage in stalking behavior to the same degree in their inventory of responses. Additionally, there are no sex differences in the number of unwanted pursuit behaviors experienced by those who initiated the breakup. A quote here from the, the, the study, males and females who had instigated the breakup were equally likely to be the victims of unwanted pursuit behaviors by their former intimates, which included theft, physical harm, and being followed. Interestingly, Men are found to be the victims of cyber stalking by a former intimate more than their female counterparts. Mullen et al. also find that women are more likely to favor electronic stalking than physical stalking, that women show the same propensity for threats, physical violence, and property damage as male offenders, are more motivated to establish a love relationship with their victims, and are likely to target men and women equally with their stalking behavior. And that finding, that last finding about targeting uh, women targeting men and women equally uh, is similar to research done into workplace bullying, which shows that uh, male workplace bullies tend to primarily target other men while uh, women workplace bullies um, tend to target men and women indiscriminately. Okay, uh, moving on, what is stalking? Stalking is a combination of harassment behaviors, both online and offline, that are unwanted by the target and induce fear, frustration, and or cause physical and psychological distress. Wigman conducted a research interview on male victims of former intimate stalking, i.e. men who are stalked by crazy ex-wives, ex-girlfriends, ex-friends with benefits, one night stands, and in some cases, women with whom they'd never been intimate. She finds, and I quote, although no definition of stalking is universally accepted, most have in common the stipulations that the behaviors or acts must be repeated and unwanted. For example, the U.S. Department of Justice, 2002, stated that stalking is the willful or intentional commission of a series of acts that would cause a reasonable person to fear death or serious bodily injury. This definition includes a fear component, although other definitions do not. And under these circumstances, cases are often considered as harassment rather than stalking. For example, Langrickson, Rowling, Polaria, Cohen, and Rowling identified unwanted pursuit behaviors comprising harassment acts and more severe stalking acts, which they defined as activities that constitute ongoing and unwanted pursuit of a romantic relationship between individuals who are not currently involved in a consensual romantic relationship with each other. Stalking or harassment acts can range from relatively minor behaviors, such as leaving unwanted messages or gifts for the victim, to more serious actions, such as following, threatening, or assaulting the victim. The 2001 British Crime Survey defined stalking as involving feelings of fear, alarm, or distress, 
because of two or more events of harassment and incorporates all types of stalking behaviors. Purcell, Path, and Mullen find that stalking by a former intimate appears to be the most severe with targets suffering more varied stalking acts in general for longer durations, as well as more threats, physical harm, and damage to their property than acquaintance stalkers stalking by family, friends, or colleagues, or stalking by strangers. Now, in my experience with my clients, their exes primarily stalk them through social media, uh, harassment by text message and email or WhatsApp, by creating fake social media accounts to try to make contact with them. Um, sometimes they will, uh, if a client has successfully blocked by phone, email, et cetera, their ex. Uh, sometimes these women will then try to get to them through third parties, such as their parents, their siblings, their friends, sometimes even their, their place of work. Um, they really have no boundaries. And the only way typically to get them to stop is you just have to completely ignore them and give them absolutely no attention or sometimes you have to seek a restraining order. Of course, that's not always effective because if somebody's um, ignoring your request to leave them the hell alone, they're also not likely to abide by a restraining order unless of course there are consequences they fear as a result of violating the restraining order, which depending on how functional or how much the ex has to lose may or may not be the case, okay. Who is likely to stalk? The usual suspects, of course. Personality disordered individuals who are more likely to engage in stalking behaviors include narcissistic, borderline, histrionic, antisocial, schizoid, and dependent personalities. There is also a high correlation with individuals who have substance abuse histories, mood disorders, sexual dysfunction, and schizophrenia. Having a significant loss within a seven year period, for example, a divorce, breakup, estrangement, loss of job, death of a child or parent is also common among stalkers. According to Mullen, both the females and males engaged in stalking because they felt rebuffed, wanted to take revenge, or thought that stalking would help them get a date. Seriously, some of them, some of them don't understand why you don't want to go out with them after they slash your tires, blow up your phone, hack into your Facebook account, and tell all of your friends that you gave them herpes. Really, they just don't understand why you, you don't want to go out on a date with them after they do something like that. Sorry, I digress. Back to my quote. But significantly, more female stalkers wanted to establish an intimate, loving relationship with the person they pursued. Both male and female subjects had delusional disorders, personality disorders, disorders, excuse me, morbid infatuations, and so forth. Male and female stalkers also tended to use similar methods of harassment, again, except that female stalkers favor electronic methods and male stalkers prefer physical pursuit. Why is it important to accurately identify these types of behaviors? Stalking and other forms of harassment are criminal behaviors. I repeat, they are criminal behaviors even when women do them. Stalking typically occurs after a breakup, although it can also occur at the onset and throughout the course of the relationship. For example, does your wife hack into your email? Harass you via text messaging throughout the workday or when you spend time with friends or family? Yes, that's harassment. It is a form of harassment. If, you, if it's unwanted and you've asked her to stop, it's harassment, even if you're still married to her. Many men view stalking behavior in women as normal female insecurity, jealousy, and or possessiveness. Of course, most of these men typically have only had relationships with borderlines, narcissists, and other emotionally unstable women. These are not normal behaviors. 
their abnormal and abusive behaviors. And they're indicative of a person who has a lack of boundaries, a shaky grasp on reality, and sociopathic tendencies. Yes, sociopathic tendencies. And by that, I mean no empathy for how their victims are feeling and the belief that only their needs, feelings, and desires matter. If you're beginning to date someone and they display stalking and harassment behaviors, it is a huge red flag. I mean, I guess we could say stalking you means she's really into you, but that's not the healthy kind of into you that you, that you wanna see in a potential mate. If your wife or girlfriend engages in these behaviors, please understand it's a form of abuse and it's wrong. If you would consider it wrong for a man to do those things to a woman, the same is true if you reverse the genders. Have you considered taking legal measures to protect yourself and your loved ones from an ex who stalks and harasses you? If not, why not? Uh, I've had several clients over the years who were able to get protective orders or non-harassment orders. They're called different things in different states and provinces, not just for themselves and their children, but for their families and for their places of employment. It is possible. And if you are being harassed by those avenues, that is something you can do. Um, you need to go through the proper channels and usually you have to notify the, the person who's stalking and harassing you in writing, particularly if it's an ex and you've had a relationship with them that you no longer want to receive, you know, have any contact with them and that any future engagement will be seen as a form of harassment. Um, and then if they continue to do so, you document it and you go to court. Like I said, it may or may not be effective um, but if she ignores it and you have a, a court that's willing to enforce its own orders, she just might end up in jail. Okay. I'm sorry. I was ad-libbing. Um, okay. Perhaps society will begin to take female criminality more seriously if we begin to prosecute women who engage in these behaviors with as much regularity as we do male offenders. Perhaps some men aren't physically afraid of their female stalkers but that doesn't make their behavior any less criminal. Being stalked and or the target of a harassment campaign can be incredibly stressful, irritating, not to mention emotionally and psychologically damaging. Law abiding citizens, and this includes men, have a right to the peaceful enjoyment of their lives free from harassment by their former intimates or other love slash revenge obsessed former slash current intimates. Um, so uh, I don't have this in the written part of the article because this happened after I published it. Uh, a, a few years back, I had a heretofore never experienced uh, form of stalking for a client I, I was working with. Um, this gentleman, uh, was married to a woman who is actually diagnosed with border, borderline personality disorder, so formal diagnosis. Um, when he left her, she literally tried to kill him. I won't say how, because that might be identifiable, but the police were called. They didn't press charges, of course, because she was just this distraught woman. Um, but uh, it, it, it was serious. It, it, there was no plausible deniability of what her intent was. Okay. So he was able to get an emergency restraining order against her in the, the country where he lives. Uh, it's the first one is good for a year. And then you have the, the opportunity to go back and seek a permanent one, which is for an extended period of time, longer than a year. Um, Ex-wife, I guess, went into treatment. Uh, went on a, a vacation for several months, uh, returned, and then appealed the restraining order to the court. Um, I wrote letters on his behalf talking about the emotional 
damage he had experienced and the trauma he's had subsequent to that and the, the work I was doing with him. And uh, she went away again for a while. And then about a little over a year later, she once again tried to get, get the restraining excuse me, restraining order thrown out, complaining that it was impeding her social life because she couldn't go out and, you know, be where she might possibly run into him. And um, <laughs> so uh, this woman has a very unique name and she began posting on the Shrink for Men Facebook page, asking questions such as, you know, what if the, the BPD person is truly sorry? Isn't isn't their former partner obligated to forgive them? Uh, no, no, your victim is not obligated to forgive you. And in fact, if you're truly sorry and your former spouse whom you abused uh, says that he or she wants nothing more to do with you, um, if you've truly benefited from your treatment, then leave them the F alone, okay? Um, so, I'm looking at this name and I'm like, God, I'm like, oh my God, is that so and so's ex? And I'm screenshotting. Uh, and sure enough, it was his ex using her maiden name, also a very unique, you know, not Smith or Johnson, a very, a very unique sounding name. And uh, I discussed with him, I'm like, well, I, I could just block her, but I'm going to have to write another um, letter for you. And I, I think um, submitting photos that she's arguing with your therapist on Facebook about your obligation to forgive her um, might just reinforce uh, the point that the restraining order needs to be kept in place. And um, long story short, uh, the restraining order remains in the in effect, and the uh, judge told her that um, if she tried to appeal this again, uh, he was going to have her uh, identified as, uh, in the States, there's a term called a vexatious litigant, which means she would need to get the court's permission before she could even file for a hearing to appeal or modify, and that she would be responsible for my client's legal fees going forward. So yes, um, new stalking experience, a client's BPDX arguing with me on Facebook, thinking I didn't know who she was. It was, yes. Um, just when you think you've seen about everything, you see something new. Anyway, um, I, uh, I think I have four articles and all in the series and I will be posting them over the next couple of weeks. So please check back. You can find a link to the original written material below the video screen, square, rectangle, whatever it's called. Again, I am Dr. Tara Palmatier of shrinkformen.com. If you have a question or would like to schedule a session with me, you can reach me at shrinkformen at gmail.com. Thank you for watching and have a good day.